Hello everyone and welcome to the York Show for Pint of Science 2021 from atoms to galaxies the circus act of gravity. Now I'm going to be your host for this evening I'm Connor and some of you may actually remember me from last year when I gave a talk that was so good they begged me to come back this year not just to give a talk but to run the whole bloody show. Now before we get started I want you to let everyone know that you're watching us tonight so I want you to tweet about us share us smash that like button and do not forget to hashtag it with hashtag pine 21 whack that in the comments down below now you can use that comment box throughout the night to get in contact with us whether you have anything you want to get off your chest or any questions for any of our speakers tonight feel free to put it in that comment box down below and maybe we'll get time to ask our speakers or read out those comments throughout the show so let's test that out i want you to tell me and the pine science team where you're watching us from tonight and also if you have any jokes about the circus or about gravity or about either of those things combined, then put those in the comments as well, and maybe we'll get to them during the show. Now, while you're testing that out, I'll take us through the schedule for tonight. So as you can see, we have an incredible lineup for you tonight, thinking about gravity from the perspective of the circus, thanks to our show opener and show closer, Circus Stu. We've also got Dr. Nate Adams thinking about how the basic processes which govern life, how they are a bit of a circus as well. And we also have a little treat for you, an interactive doodling experience from York-based artist Stephen Lee Hodgkin, something we can all get involved in. So if everyone's ready, then I think we're ready to go. Now, our first speaker is a chemist by trade, but also a seasoned circus performer with a passion for defying gravity. Can please everyone give a big, warm welcome to our show opener, Circus Stew. Hi, everyone. Lovely to be here tonight. Hi, Circus Stu. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. Nice. Well, I'm very excited to see what you have planned for us tonight. But I think first you should tell yeah, us a little bit about I've got yourself. Lots of things to plan. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I like spinning around. So um, yeah, I started as a chemist uh, here in York when I came uh, you know, came to be a student in this fair city, and um, I then moved on um, just just nearly four years ago to, um, to put all my um, circus um, hobbies that I've had into a, a community circus company. So I, I now run a, a community circus company. I can come and do parties for adults and children. I go into school to do circus related PE lessons and I do circus science in schools as well. So I go in and uh, teach some science principles uh, from, the, uh, from the perspective of the circus. Nice. Well, I'm very excited to see what you've got planned for us tonight. So just before you get started, I want to urge all our listeners, if you have any questions for Circus Stew or any of our speakers tonight, please put them in the comments down below and we'll hopefully get to them later. But for now, the stage is your Circus Stew. Please take it away. Thank you very much. So we're looking at this mystery force of gravity that uh, controls. And just like the seer will can just float quite happily by itself, and it looks like it's it's uh, just floating by itself. It, I gave it some energy, and gravity was trying to pull it to the to the floor. But um, because I'd given it some energy in one direction, it it just kept on going. Um, and it's like that for our, for the atoms. Uh, we've all anything that's got weight, from atoms to things made of atoms to massive things made of atoms such as stars planets they all have this energy and uh, uh from from gravity acting on them i can hop into the system and i can watch things going around me and because there is actually friction in this situation that energy is being lost and it's now dissipated into the floor so um, you have to so it's quite fun uh, uh, looking at these kind of things and what you can do in the circus so this happens to be a sear wheel it's um it's got mechanical engineering built into it it comes to part in five different sections um, and it's strong enough to do wacky things like this so we shall put this down for a second and we're going to look at some things we can do together 
this evening in circus. So, um, of course, the problem with um, a lot of circus things is that it requires a bit of training. So, for instance, here are three juggling balls. Gravity is acting on them, so I have to make effort in throwing them up and then catching them and then throwing them up again. And when you're learning juggling, it's quite tricky. But if you, uh, if you use science, you think, well, actually, what do I want to do to, um, to reduce, reduce the speed of the falling object? If you use the fact that there's another secret invisible thing in this room, in this barn that I come in, called air, we can use air resistance to slow things down. So here's a scarf floating really slowly. So you can actually then learn to juggle using scarves and you've got a lot more time to think about things. So what we're going to have a go at is learning to juggle tonight. Uh, and if you've got some scarves at home, then it's a good time to find some. But we're going to actually get you to make some of your own juggling ball. So here is, let's uh, bring it right up here close. Here is a juggling ball that's actually made from a bag full of uh, pulses and some balloons. So what you need to do is you'll probably all have a bag, freeze the bag or something like that. And then you just have to get some, or here you can see I've got some lentils in, some red lentils. Rice works nicely. You want something that's dry, that's not going to make a mess should your bag split. Uh, and that you can possibly reuse again. So all you do to make your juggling ball is you twist it around and uh, the amount of um, contents is, is dependent on how big you want the ball to be. So you can, you can just guess how much you need in. Twist it around. I'm going to do that around like that. And then, then with the balloon and a pair of scissors, you cut the neck off the balloon. Now, most people find it quite tricky cutting balloons. Um, it's actually harder than you think. You need quite a nice, precise pair of scissors. So now you open up the balloon and the neck, and you simply stuff the balloon over your, bean, your bag full of pulses or whatever it is. So can you see, we've got a really nice bit, just fill it around. So if you'd left the neck on, then um, that would be much harder to stop. You see, we've only got a little bit now. I even, if you remember my, my one I made earlier, I've got a second uh, covering on. So if you get a second balloon, I've got a green one here. And in order to bring through the color of the, um, let's come to the side here so you can see here, um, to bring through the color of the red balloon, you just get a little spit and you cut a little nick out of the balloon. And you want to do this, I'll bring it here as well, see if that's easy to see. It's so quite tricky, just get this little pinch of a balloon. Can you see that little pinch? You just cut a little bit off. I and mean, we're going to go around and make these tiny holes in the balloon. Of course, if you blew up the balloon, this would be impossible. You'd just go bang. Pop. Do that. Okay. And then cut the neck off again. Uh, I find if you stretch the balloon slightly, it cuts slightly easier. He says, having trouble cutting this one. There we are. Okay, so the second balloon. Find where the the hole is, and we're going to pull the balloon over from that bit. And this time we have to be slightly more careful um, because we've cut holes in our balloon, in our uh, second balloon, and and that can cause the balloon to rip. So I'll do this. And if if you do this relatively carefully, then you end up with, as you can see, the red showing through. And you can see, uh, if 
a bit of work i can make that hole a lot smaller and that's how you make your jogging ball so you need three of those okay um if you want to juggle with three um and this is a nice size so that's that so we're going to do that and we've got a second thing for you tonight because making the balloons um making the balloons is really simple simple super fast okay uh, as you can see i made one in just a few minutes um and it, you can just do it all quick so we're going to have a go at making a flower stick now some of you may not be aware what a flower stick is this is a uh, a shop bought one so it's a long stick with tassels on the end if i bring it up there you can see in the other camera the tassels and there's two hand sticks and what you can do with a flower stick is you can roll it up and down and you can see why it's called a flower stick because when you roll it the tassels uh, spread out and you can do tricks with this uh, you can even do fun tricks like that which is looks like we're making gravity not work and it's awesome uh, so we're gonna have a go at doing that so uh, the easiest way to do it is using newspaper so you need to get yourself some newspaper or a magazine um, newspaper tends to work a bit better because uh, to make plastics work we have to have a bit of friction and if you use a smooth magazine or maybe a4 printer paper um, there's not much grip that it's much smoother than than the, the cheaper newspaper that we get so get some newspaper and what you have to do uh, is roll up let's get um, several sheets I've got about four sheets here roll it up so I have to come really close I normally try to start off the rolling bit by folding a teeny like half a centimeter width there okay if you do this on a table it's much easier I'm doing midair so it's much harder so we go like that and you have a and you have a the central roll then if you at this point you have some elastic bands to hand then you can you can pop it round there there's the second one and then that gives you time to then go and get your solar tape and to seal um, uh, the tube so you're going to do that you can do the same but on a smaller scale um here's here's one i've done earlier um this is using a4 paper so this these are the hand sticks so these are really tightly wound because paper as you may be aware has very little strength when you roll it up then then you uh, strengthen it and what we want to be careful is when we're catching the flower stick that the actual hand sticks don't bend okay so you need to make two of those and you can see i don't know if you can see clear i've i've put a whole load of line of sellotape from one end to the other again i use uh, elastic bands so once you've done that we're then gonna so i have my tube there what you need to do is to make with another two sheets of paper you roll it up but this time you're going to end up making a a width that's about oh, i'd say three centimeters there like that and then what i do with these i pre-roll them like that just so it, um, it gets a rough, roughly the right shape. And this time have a elastic band ready and because we need to make the end of uh, um, the flower stick, the bowl bit. So we're going to wrap this around. And then if you have got an elastic band on you, you can quickly put that on to hold it in place. And then you can get sellotape and stick it on. Um, what we want to make sure is that we have a reasonable um, amount of paper sticking out here. I'll show you on one that I made earlier. So you see here, um, you can see there's a nice uh, thick bit there. So the, it's almost a, a little finger width sticking up from the actual tube. And of course, on this one, you can see uh, I've coated I've coated this. Uh, with uh, wrapping paper to make it look pretty. So it'll be great if you can, uh, well, it just look like newspaper to turn it into something looking pretty. So um, once you've uh, got to that point, 
okay? And you're happy with this end. To get the tassels, you simply get your pair of scissors and start cutting along. And sometimes it's better to not stick anything until right at the end, so you can slide that down to make it easier to cut along. If you make, you can make these a centimeter long, it really doesn't matter. So you then spread them out and you've got your tassels. Um, so I haven't actually made those ones particularly uh, long. It doesn't really matter how long they are. Uh, you can see uh, on this one here, I made these ones a bit longer. Um, so it's up to you to experiment with, okay? Uh, and then you, of course, then for this one, you have to make a second ring at the end, cut that end so that you end up with something looking a bit like that. So uh, hopefully you can uh, do that while you, whilst you watch the rest of the show quite easily. And, and then at the end of the show, I'll be coming back and I'm going to teach you some tricks on how to use the flower sticks and to quickly learn how to juggle. So that's great. Any questions you can chuck in the in the uh, chat. Thank you so much, yeah. Circus Chew. That was great. Great instructions. Now, we're going to be seeing you, yeah, as you said, again at the end of the show. But for now, yeah. I hope everyone at home enjoyed that. I hope they're all busy making. So, um, yeah, we'll have a big round of applause for Circus Chew, and we'll see you a bit later. Cool. Thank you very much. Right, okay. So before we move on to our next speaker, I think we've just got some time to check in with our audience and see where it is you're watching from. Richard Higgins from Leeds. Shout out to Leeds, near, near me. Alan McGee listening from Chicago. Wow, we're international. Chicago, Illinois, USA. Anyone else? Watching from Patrick May, watching from his caravan in Pembrokeshire. Lovely. Have we got any jokes as well? Or also some jokes about the circus or about gravity? Have we got anything come in? Oh, here we go. Okay, so we've got a joke from uh, someone called Liam Barrett. He says, my friend was sacked from working on the Dodgems. It's okay, though, because he's suing them for funfair dismissal. Brilliant. Great joke. Classic. Keep them coming in. Keep the jokes coming in. Keep telling us where you're watching from. And also tell us what you're drinking tonight, because this is pint of science after all. So now it's time to introduce our next guest, Dr. Nate Adams. Now, Nate is the is currently the senior science officer at Nanotemper Technologies based in Munich, where he's speaking tonight. But he's also a freelance science communicator with a passion for aerial circus. So please give a big warm welcome to Dr. Nate Adams. Hello. Hi, Nate. Hello. Wie geht's? Ich bin in Deutschland. Hallo. <laughs> How's life over in Munich? Uh, it is slowly getting better. I am drinking a delicious Munich pale. It's alcohol fry because it's still only Wednesday and the pubs opened on Saturday. So I may have drunk a few actual alcoholic beers on the weekend and I'm still recovering a little bit. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people are recovering today. The pubs opened in England yesterday. Mm. So well, I guess we'll see. Maybe no one's drinking. Yeah. But I'm very excited <laughs> to see what you have planned for us tonight, night, Nate. So please take it away. So uh, originally when I was asked to do this, uh, the idea was the lockdown would be over, I would still be able to train, I would, I'd be able to perform, but I arrived in Germany and basically we went into our third wave and I've been in a hard lockdown now for the last four months and have been unable to train aerial circus. But very nicely, the lovely people at Planck Science York have said that I can play in a video. So last year, we produced a lockdown passion project called Physical Education. And the film that I'm going to show tonight is one of the films that I made uh, as part of that project, which is looking at fundamentals of molecular biology. So hopefully, with a bit of movie magic, that film should play now is important. It's the fundamental molecule of life and it defines who you are. Modern biology places a lot of importance on that generic, I mean, genetic code. But for me, a human being is so much more than just a genetic code. It's a combination of thoughts, feelings, emotion, urges. And from a purely technical standpoint, fats, carbohydrates and proteins swimming about in a load of water. You're effectively a walking, talking, sentient can of soup. 
DNA is apparently the recipe book for a human being, but that's not quite true. In fact, it's the instruction manual to produce proteins, and it's the proteins that go on to work or acquire all those other things like carbohydrates, fats, nucleotides, amino acids, micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, everything that you need to be a human being. Now that recipe book, that DNA, it does encode in terms of us a sentient can of soup, but with minor changes, you could then become a fern, a fish, a flatworm, a fungi, a ferret, and so on. This is what we rather gladly call the fundamental dogma of molecular biology, where you go from DNA to this stuff called RNA, which then becomes protein. Now, for our purposes, we can ignore this bit in the middle and just talk about the whole DNA going to protein. Let me explain. A piece of that genetic code exits the nucleus and it comes into contact with a rather large molecular machine. It's called a ribosome and it's gigantic biologically speaking. This machine latches on, and what it does is it reads that genetic code, passing along the DNA, and out the other end, spits out a bit of protein. And then, when it's done, it pops off. But at this point, you've just got a long line of floppy protein. And everything in biology is defined by its shape. It needs to fold. Now, there are three basic shapes in biology. There's random floppy loop, which doesn't actually have a shape. Or there's a beautiful helix. And you probably will have seen that before with DNA. Well, there's a third one in proteins. And that is called a sheet. These are long protective regions that sort of protect the inner cores. So folding is an incredible process. We don't really understand a lot of it, and to be honest, if we did, then we would live in a utopia. We would have unlimited medicine or the food that we'd need. But I don't know whether you've noticed, we don't live in a utopia at the moment. Now, even with our best supercomputers, we can get like a vague idea. Now we have other ways of getting pictures, but what the protein is doing is it's folding up, hiding all of its water-hating bits on the inside and keeping all the water-loving bits on the outside. What it's doing is it's hunting for its most energetically favorable conformation. We call this falling into a thermodynamic well. And once we have a folded protein, then all the fun begins. Because this is biology, everything is a little bit squishy. And so, from one single fold or shape, the protein can actually change its conformation. Depending on whether it's really acidic outside or alkaline, whether it's really salty, or whether it's near hollow to fat. And that's because there's a lot of conformational flexibility. Oh, look, it's a rope. So for loads of proteins, this is where their story ends. They do something structural, they hang about in the cell, they do their thing. 
but there's a special type of protein that I want to talk about because that's what I work on. Now, life, if you think about it, is just loads and loads of chemical reactions happening, thousands of them happening within your cells. Loads of these reactions, they don't happen fast enough for life to survive. They need to be sped up, and this is where something amazing comes along, an enzyme. Enzymes are the catalysts of life. They speed up chemical reactions. Let me show you how. Let's just take any old random enzyme. It's probably just sort of hanging out, floating around in the cell, gently pulsating. Maybe it's a bit more excitable. And then suddenly, maybe something that it wants to bind to comes along and it changes its conformation. It binds to it and this enzyme will then act on it and do something to it. But when it's done, It will reset and then just float about in the cell again, doing its thing. I work on enzymes called molecular motors, and these are motors in the truest sense of the word. They take in a cellular fuel called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP for short, and they burn a chemical bond between phosphorus and oxygen. This produces something called chemomechanical motion, which is then transferred and then used to power a reaction. For example, muscle movement. But for this bit of the routine to work, uh, it's pretty hard to wear a microphone when you're not wearing any clothes. So I've had to use a bit of movie magic and my psychic powers to tell you the story. Muscle movement is powered by molecular motors. And within your cells is an amazing architecture, a cytoskeleton made from a protein called actin. For your muscles to do their thing, a molecular motor called myosin grabs onto this skeleton, takes some of that chemical fuel, adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, and then burns a phosphorus oxygen bond to produce a power stroke. And without molecular motors working consistently and precisely all the time, not only could I not move out in the air, I and you couldn't move at all. And what I find remarkable about all of this is that it's not just happening in me while I'm prattling about on this rope, but this is how all movement happens. And even when you're not moving, your enzymes are working, your molecular motors are doing things, your heart is constantly beating, your liver is removing toxins from your blood. This incredible dance occurring at the nanoscale within your cells is allowing you to survive and to thrive. So, there you incredible, go. incredible stuff, Nate. Honestly, incredible upper body strength for Matthew as well. I miss it now. It's been a while. <laughs> but I do, tomorrow, I'm allowed to go to a circus space and actually practice and train for the first time in four months. Five, five months. I'm just really excited. Nice. Right, so I think we have time now for some audience questions for you, Nate. But I'm going to kick us off because that was an incredible performance. But I've heard you're no stranger, really, to talking about science to the public on a big stage. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been doing it for... Uh, quite a few years. I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm pretty old now. Uh, so yeah, a few years ago, well, when I was doing my PhD, I was in that really depressing part of my PhD where you hate everything, no experiments are working, nothing's happening. And I accidentally got a job with the BBC and they took me on tour. And then they were nice enough to throw me in front of the camera for a few of the BBC shows. And then I've just sort of done a lot of other things as well, such as making art and doing rock concerts with science and just loads of exciting things. So, yeah, I've done a few things. You really are our celebrity <laughs> guest this evening. So um, do we have any questions from the audience coming in? Pierre, our chapter manager here in New York, says it's amazing to do that routine whilst science communicating, which it really is. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, it took a lot of learning how to breathe properly. So this is one of the things. Um, you can actually watch a few of the films that we made um, on a website called physicaleducation.uk. 
And the hardest thing about practicing and learning how to do this was learning how to breathe properly. Because when you're doing circus, you also have to think about breathing in terms of when you're inverting, you breathe out, when you engage your abs. If you've ever done sit-ups, you know, you, that's the rules with yoga and Pilates as well. You breathe out when you're engaging your abs. But then if you're trying to speak at the same time, it's really difficult. So we had to practice for ages, learning how to talk while also doing all the moves. So yeah, but thanks. I was that actually set up my next question. I was going to ask you what took longer, learning the process of protein synthesis off by heart like that, or learning that aerial silks routine. Uh, so I, I you, can, you could compare the two, I suppose. So it took me what three, four years to get my PhD. Well, it took me three years to do my PhD, but then all my other education before that. And then in terms of aerial, I started that when I turned 30. So that was five years ago. And I did it sort of as a hobby for three years. And then I started doing it more and more. I got really excited by it. Um, I started training a bit more professionally. And then I went to uh, professional circus school uh, in 2019, which is when I finally got fit enough and uh, confident enough to actually be able to perform in front of a crowd and do what I was doing there. So about the same length of time to do a PhD is to become a circus performer. I'm sure if you did it more intense rather than a hobby, then, you know, it'd be quicker. Nice, so that's a fallback plan for any PhD students who- Yeah, yeah, yeah. join the circus, run away to the circus. I want to, still. <laughs> nice, so I'm hearing from backstage that I think you explained it so well in that video. No, we don't have any questions. All we've got for you is compliments. Oh, so I think we got some, so Amanda C says, nice silk moves, Nate. Cheers. <laughs> Jasmine says she's so impressed by the fact you're doing these skills and presenting science at the same time. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be really interesting to see how fit I am right now. I'm going to just even see if I can get myself upside down tomorrow. That's going to be because all I've had is a yoga mat and running. And I absolutely hate running with a passion, but it's all I've had for four months. Yeah, I think a lot of people have found it very difficult. So I think if we just had a question come in. Okay, we've got a question here from Phil. So how do you find the inspiration slash innovation to make these links between things like silks and DNA? And how did you design this content? So one of the key goals with this project and also with the science communication that I do is to look beyond the usual ways of communicating science. So you know, when you see a lot of circus science stuff, a lot of it is about gravity. So you'll see people who do the pole, the physics of pole dancing and things like that, which is great. But I wanted to try and see if you could be a bit more um, lyrical with what you're doing, be a bit more descriptive using the shape and the, and I'm not a dancer in any way, shape or form, but to use your body movements to help describe other physical processes. And the thing with silks is that uh, there's a whole part of it called rap theory. And all those different raps that I was doing involves understanding how these fabrics come together to hold your body in position and maintain friction. And that's really, really key. And I think that also works really well within protein folding as well, because it's those different conformations that allow you to produce those beautiful shapes. So that's where it started coming in my head. And then I was like, well, let's see what I can do with it. Let's see if I can make a little routine based on this. And because I like talking about science, I thought science circus biology, science communication was the way forward. Brilliant. So I'll just finish off with this, Nate, and it's quite similar to Phil's question, but we've obviously seen you communicate in science tonight and you've been doing that for some time and it's clear you're still passionate about it. So what do you think it is about science itself that has allowed you to keep that high energy and passion when you talk about science to members of the public? Because oh, I just really like doing science. So I'm lucky enough that I'm still able to get in the lab. You know, I was in the lab this afternoon. Um, so I have this new job over here in Munich where I'm working in biotech now. So I've moved away from academia for the moment, working in biotech, and I'm just working with the most amazing instruments, working on some of the hardest problems that we're facing in biology at the moment. I, you know, especially with the COVID pandemic, I, I'm, I, I, weirdly, I'm considered an essential worker on that because I'm working on that at the moment. And I just get very excited with what we can reveal and the speed of current biology, current molecular biology and current technology that we can adapt to situations that have arisen 
And yeah, I just find that super exciting. So I still love being in the lab and I, that's what gives me the drive every day to continue working. But also I love talking about science because I think science should be a part of everyday society. It shouldn't just be this nerdy thing that some people do, but I think it should just be part of who we are as society. Completely agree. Nate, you've been fantastic. That's all we've got time for at the moment. We might join you again at the end of the show. But thank, thank you so much. Me. Thanks so much for the contribution tonight. Please, everyone, give a big round of applause to Dr. Nate Adams. Right, so before we move on, I think we've now just got a bit of time to check back in with our audience. So I asked you what you're drinking tonight because this is Pint of Science. I'm on the waters at the moment, but I'll probably treat myself later. Maybe have an alcoholic lager beer. Don't know. Any, any, anyone tell us what they're drinking tonight? No? Come on, someone give me something. No, we got nothing. No one's drinking tonight. You must all be hung over from the pub's opening yesterday. So I guess we'll move on. We've got a little interlude for you now, a nice little treat, an interactive experience that everyone at home can hopefully get involved in. I hope everyone does get involved in it. Please welcome a York-based artist. He's a community printmaker, a doodler, and a self-taught artist. Please welcome our special guest, Stephen Lee Hodgkins. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Stephen. You're right. How are you doing tonight? I'm really good, thank you. How are you doing? I'm very good. Have you been enjoying the show from backstage? I have, yeah, I have. It's, it's uh, really, really interesting. Nice. Well, um, you've got some interactive art-based activities we can get involved in at the moment, yeah, right? And, and I've tried to kind of go along a uh, user um a gravity based theme um so i i've asked people kind of if they brought a piece of paper and some pens to have a think about kind of doodling um and uh, because doodling I, i'm a massive fidget and the way i got into sort of art was through fidgeting and that led me to doodling and, and it also is a great way to kind of think so i kind of think i've sort of learned a lot of things through uh, being more uh, doodling more so kind of keeping the pen going and that kind of can help you sort of you know generate ideas or kind of get new perspectives on it and it's all about kind of movement so along with the circus thing tonight so um, in terms of that topic I uh, had a little thing about what I might say and not being science-based but uh, kind of thinking a little bit about critical uh, angles on gravity, I wanted to pose a question to people and get them to doodle. Uh, so maybe sort of just scribble a few lines, scribble some words and come up with an icon uh, uh, to answer the question, is gravity real or a social construct? And maybe what you can do is send that in at the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a bit of a whistle uh, stop tour of uh, some of the things that I found out about gravity and social constructivism and uh, see where we go from that. So does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Take it away, Stephen. Okay, so, um, so kind of, you know, is gravity real or is it a uh, social construct? So um, as we've uh, seen from Nate and the lovely Stu, um, gravity is an understanding about how things are um brought towards one another, uh, why apples fall off of trees, why the moon causes tidal waves, why the ink flew off of this pen and uh, stayed on the paper. And also it is um, a seemingly unquestionable fact. People say that gravity is really real because if you walk off a cliff, you will plummet to your death. And also Nate demonstrated that uh, with, his, uh, with, with his strength on the silks. Um, Newton suggested that gravity is a force that attracts two things towards one another. And Einstein described gravity as a curvature of time and space caused by mass energy. Oh, no. Have you lost me? Sorry, you lost me there for a moment. Am I back? Yeah, I think I'm back. <laughs> um, but what about gravity before Newton and Einstein? Did people think of it as magic? Um, and did it have any re relevance in their lives as they kind of went about mucking out the horses? Um, so I want to kind of switch over here now to uh, tell you a little about 
kind of social constructionism, um, and which is a kind of an understanding about how knowledge and meaning is made up through the in the world through language and communication. Um, so how we kind of use our, our language kind of brings our realities to uh, our experience of being in the world, um, and it and it does this because it suggests knowledge and assumptions about reality are fluid contextual and embedded within experiences of power you could argue and culture um, social constructionism doesn't say gravity isn't real necessarily rather it highlights the role of human language and cultural values in the way we come to know and frame it we only know three things through the words we use with others to interact with them but doesn't that just lead us up the garden path? Reality exists, but only through language and social interactions. And what about social constructionism before language? Was that magic also? So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, gravity and the something called the so-called hoax. Um, and this was performed uh, by a physics professor, Alan Solko, who submitted and got accepted an article to the journal Social Text in 1996. And Social Text is a kind of journal about critical theory, really. Um, and his article was called, um, it, was in a, it was in a journal um, edition called Science Wars, and it was about kind of a critique of uh, science and the science method and sort of philosophy of science, that kind of thing. Um, and his article was called Transgressing the Boundaries Towards a Transformative Hermeneutics of Quantum Gravity. Now, her hermeneutics is about um, sort of in interpretations. It's a theory of interpretation. And so Alan Solko said that this was an experiment to test the journal's intellectual rigor. And he was kind of suggesting a ridicule of this uh, critical theory in the face of science and said that he'd made up the ideas using a sort of nonsense postmodernist writing style that quoted other authors and were usually discussed, that were usually discussed in the journal and aligned to sort of a radical critical stance. And it caused a bit of controversy. And it is an interesting story, if you don't know about it, in the history of sort of science and philosophy of science debate. Um, but we can also think that what this was tapping into was a bit about the debate and the distinction that goes on between realism and relativism, subjectivity and objectivity, truth and facts, or storytelling and culture. So at the same time, uh, we have um, the sociology of science being suggested by Harry Collins, who spent sort of to, to date, I think, has spent about 30 years tracing the search um, for gravitational waves and, and, and he's and he using sort of conversational analysis or discourse analysis sort of approach. He's showing how scientific data can be subject to a subjective interpretive flexibility and non scientific positions can be mobilized to close down scientific controversies. Science, Harry suggests, is a social interaction, a performative act, a language game, dare I say, rather than something that is purely objective and uh, independently observable. So I thought the point I might like to make tonight in thinking about Harry and Alan um, in this sort of pint of science circus night is about both the value of having knowledge about gravity in that we know not to walk off of higher ledges but also about the value of challenging ourselves to be critical and reflective of the sort of emotional syntax errors that happen when we dare to question things we assume as really hard facts or very established ways of doing. And that through doing both those things, we might like unlock and discover some new and unique ways of seeing and being in the world. So my question to you at the beginning is gravity real or a social construct uh, I think it's probably a decent bit of both thank you Stephen brilliant thank you really fun. I, I really hope everyone joined in with our home that was really fun a really nice journey you took us on unfortunately we're gonna have to say bye for now because we're running a bit short on time but thank you so much for that interlude
Thank you for your contribution tonight. You've been great. Let's all give a big round of applause to Stephen Lee Hodgkins. Okay, so I've heard we've had some drinks come in, some questions about drinks or comments about drinks. So we've just got time to check in on what our audience is drinking tonight. Jasmine, she's drinking a Whitstable Pale Ale. Nice. Jessica Dobson, she's drinking Pims. It's Pims o'clock. Nice one. What else we got? Callum, a Yorkshire Milk Stout. That sounds interesting. Any more? Jess is drinking moonshine as well, apparently. Pims and moonshine. Interesting combo. She'll feel rough tomorrow. So um, do we have any more jokes as well? Any more jokes coming about circus or the gravity, the gravity, or both combined? Any more jokes? Why are circus performers often stressed? Because their job is intense. Nice. Brilliant. Any more? Is that the last one? Okay, I think that's all we got for jokes. I think that's all we, all we got time for as well. So now it's time to move on and to finish up our York 2021 show. Please, can everyone please welcome back Circus Stu. Hello, everyone. Oh, I've just, just got this press article and it's it's a, it's about anti-gravity and I just can't put it down. Oh. Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, there we are. I've got rid of that. Okay, good. Excellent. So hopefully you have made some juggling balls so i'm going to quickly take you through how to juggle so if you haven't bothered to make juggling balls or you haven't bothered to get any scarves then please can you just get three objects and i want you to start with two objects one one side of you one on the other side and one in the hand and we're simply going to pass this over there pick up one and we're going to keep on doing that so if i show you using scarves you'll see it's a bit clearer okay this is the basic pattern for juggling in fact it's often useful to think about something else while you're doing these things so you're just trying to train your mind so for example in the fourth century uh, bc the ancient Greeks believed that objects were trying to uh, find their natural place and that the planets were moved by invisible crystal spheres. And it was Aristotle at that time who said that the heavier the object, the faster it, it fell. So that theory of gravity held for a thousand years before this guy called Galileo Galilei that you may have come across in 1589 did this famous uh, uh, famous experiment where he dropped two uh, cannonballs, a sort of medium-sized one and a big one, off the Tower of Pisa. And he said that he predicted that both would land at the same time, unlike Aristotle, who said that the heavier one would uh, fall first. So I hope you're still doing this thing because it's important to keep going, keep going. And and Galileo found that they fell at exactly the same time. Uh, and the only slight difference was air resistance. A uh, hundred years later, Isaac Newton, who was a very strange scientist, um, he uh, he wrote down the laws of motion and gravity uh, and he created um, ways of describing in mathematics uh, and we and everyone thought he had nailed it completely uh, and where's my red one it blew away okay so okay we've gone that far <clears throat> so you get that pattern going and then whether you're using scarves or balls you start throwing the objects a bit higher so you get used to there. And you notice I'm sitting down, I'm kneeling down, because then you've got the floor uh, uh, to catch the things. You can do this standing up over a table, a settee, that works quite nicely. I'll show you that in a, with bean bags. Okay, so just throw them. So you're getting used to throwing the items, not having to think too much about it. So I'm not, I'm not even bothering to look where the... Uh, the bean bags are so that's quite a strange feeling i normally look okay so once you get used to that you can then start throwing them a bit higher and you can stay start trying to catch them so with bean bags it's a bit harder you can 
you can start with just one, go backwards and forwards, catch, and then you put a second one in. So you throw the first when it comes to that point, you throw the second. So throw, throw, catch, catch, throw, throw, catch, catch. Most people find it easier to start with the hand that doesn't write so that your your stronger hand gets to do the second throw because most people panic at the second throw. So it's nice and gentle. And it's just a matter of learning to carry on doing it. And of course, if you decided to find some silk scarves, you just get a lot more time and then you can just come off the ground and juggling. And of course I go off the screen then, head vanished. Okay, so that is juggling in quite easy moves. So, oh yes, how, how far can it change the angle? So, hopefully you have created your flower stick and, and you've created two hand sticks. So if we just have the uh, main front camera at this point, thank you. All the clever people there. So the first trick you can try is simply rolling it backwards and forwards. And depending on how much friction you have between your flower stick and your hand sticks, it might go rather quickly or it might go slowly. Uh, it'll go slower if you've made big tassels. Um, if you've got really smooth paper, as I have at the minute, because I covered it, covered the newspaper with a uh, wrapping paper, it'll go much, much quicker. Oh. Uh, so you can do that. You can try throwing in the air and catching. And this is where you start testing. Uh, so I've got some some uh, poorer made hand sticks. So these oh, these aren't too bad. But uh, when you uh, start throwing these objects, this is when suddenly your your flower your hand stick can start bending when you catch it, and then that's not good, and you have to just make a new one. Uh, roll up. Uh, it's even tighter. So get used to throwing it, and then you have a little go at doing a somersault. And this is when you'll find that the flower stick loves to be on the floor. So if I can do that a bit better, oh, there we are. Uh, the, uh, the useful hint for this is to try to keep your, your hand sticks in sort of a nice distance apart, okay? Because if you try and catch it like that, it falls off. Keep it nice and wide, it's more stable. Okay, and so, and the last trick I want to show you to see if I can achieve what I showed you at first is uh, uh, show you this in slow motion as much as slow motion it can happen. So you're going to drop one, it's going to spin down here. When it gets reach that point, we're going to just rotate the stick around in little circles like that to keep it going. So, as you can see, <coughs> that didn't work very well. I, this one I haven't solitaped yet. Which I'm sure that doesn't help. Oh, I got a few turns then. Let's try this again. Oh, yes. So it's a matter of finding just the amount of energy. Notice how little I'm I'm moving the stick. I'm just doing a teeny weeny circle. Most people think, oh, you have to go wild like that, but no, it's all small. You only have to give it a little extra energy to keep it going around. So that's called um, the toothbrush uh, 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 because you can actually do it with the toothbrush on the end of your little finger. If you're doing that at home and you're doing it in the bathroom, make sure you close the toilet lid. Think about that. Why? Okay, so are we doing time? Fine. So next stage from Isaac Newton, who, who created these laws of motion, um, uh, it was no longer a theory, it was set in law, as it were. Einstein, Albert Einstein, who Stephen mentioned, came along in 1907 to, uh, to 1915 and came up with this amazing new thing called general relativity. It's a theory of um, gravitation uh, so that the observed gravitational attraction between masses results from the warping of space and time by those masses. Now, if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. Uh, and it also explains why light gets bent around really heavy objects. So light going past our sun will, will, will get bent uh, a little bit. Uh, light going past a, a super dense black hole will get bent a lot more. It's called a sort of gravity lensing effect. Uh, so, so Albert Einstein brought this new theory, which 
described in fine detail what Newton had failed to explain. Newton's laws uh, are fine. They, they explain most things in gravity. But uh, Albert Einstein needed to fine tune it. And no doubt in 100 years time, there may be a new theory of gravity. Who knows? But uh, the nice thing about uh, working in the sciences, uh, working in circus, sorry, is I can apply my scientific knowledge uh, to make tricks easier, to make uh, my life easier, to keep, uh, keep me safe, uh, to be able to wear really nice clothes. Because as a chemist, someone has designed uh, dyes to uh, stick to clothing. It's great. So let's see if Connor's coming back. Yeah. Thank you, Stu. That was that was great. There was a lot of fun. I've got my flower stick that I made. Uh -huh. oh, I've been, practicing. I've been practicing with it. Um, I think I'm pretty decent, actually. I think I might have you out of a job soon if I oh, keep, good. keep practicing. So I think we've just got time for one quick question, Circus Stu, from yep. the audience. So Phil asked about your wheel that you were using at the start. He asked, how long can you spin in the hoop before you get too dizzy to continue? <laughs> um, I, I've got to the stage where uh, I've only been doing this sear wheel seriously for a year and a half, and it's been rather affected by pandemic and not having anywhere to practice. Um, uh, uh, so I've, um, uh, I have found that as I've got better, I spin faster. When I spin faster, I get dizzy again. After two weeks, I get used to spinning that fast, and then I go faster again, and then I get dizzy, and then I get used to that. So I don't know. It'll take me a it'll take me a while to be able to just carry on. Um, but I can spin slowly. It's slow enough to be able to carry on for, for minutes. I, I reckon if I didn't crash into the wall. I'm in a relatively small space here. Um, I'm a, it's about five meters wide, and ideally I'd like seven or eight meters. Because um, when you're learning, it, it's really quite hard to steer. Like anyone learning to ride a bicycle, you know, it's you're all upright and you turn the corner and think, oh, no. And it's just like that with the sear wheel. You're learning to, to turn this thing that doesn't even have a handlebar. And you think, oh, it's terrible. So, you know, I'll, I'll see. I'll just see how, how far I can do it while you, while you talk here. Okay, there we are. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've come out already. <laughs> but, well, but I'm not being busy. Circus but, you, you've been amazing. Thank you so much for kicking off and closing the show for us tonight. Uh, okay, it's a pleasure. Hope everyone at home gives a big round of applause to Circus Stew. Okay, so we've just got quick time to check back in with the audience. I think what what's everyone drinking? Where they're from? Any jokes? Bob, he's drinking dihydrogen monoxide. Very funny. Yeah, glass of water. I'm on the waters as well. Anything else, or is that it? I think we're nearing the end of the show now. Pierre, he's on the water as well. Has a pro had a proper job yesterday. Nice one. Right, okay. So I think that's it. I think we're at the end of the show, everyone. It's been great. Thank you, obviously, to Circus Stew, to Stephen and to Nate for their massive contributions, helping to make this a really good show tonight. But Pine of Science is obviously always a big team effort. So thank you so much to the Pine of Science team, to Rachel Collins, who brought this circus concept to life, to Amelia and to Nat, who've been working tirelessly backstage. Thank you to our producer, Adam, who's been... Um, working backstage as the producer, bringing this all together, making sure everything runs smoothly. Yeah, thanks to the Central Pine the Science team. Thank you to Pierre, our chapter manager. But most importantly, thank you to you, the listener, for joining us tonight. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much. I really hope you had a good time. You can relive this event and any of the Pine of Science events on the Facebook page, the Pine of Science YouTube channel, or on the Pine of Science website itself. Thank you so much. Stay safe and don't go changing.